Hello! Today we are going to be talking about an evergreen topic on booktube of types of review styles, critical reviewing, enjoying what you're reading, all of that. And this is a topic that does come up all of the time on booktube. It is one of those things in the book community that we talk about frequently along with our audiobooks, real books, which genres people think are better, things like that. Because this is the nature of booktube and people liking to discuss what they like, but it sort of forms this false dichotomy and we're gonna get into all that today. You might be thinking, hey, I think I've seen a video from you about this before. Yes, you've probably seen a few. I did one way back in 2015 when the critical review thing was starting to get more popular. I did a video in 2018 about the pendulum swinging the other way and really critically reviewing because I'm a person that actually enjoys balance in life. So the warning that this is probably going to be a long video because I'm actually pulling in a number of different things in this video. I'm talking about the concept of critical review and analysis and enjoyment and how all of that does tie together, as well as how we discuss things on Twitter. Yes, I'm talking about Twitter again. I've also done a video about this before. Can't ignore that one of the main reasons I am bringing this up again on my channel is because this round of talking about critical reviewing, a tweet that I put out was one of the focal points of the discussion. I was really hesitant if I wanted to bring this up again because I do find it kind of exhausting. However, I am somebody that deeply cares about being misunderstood and about people misconstruing my words, and that is something I'm trying to work on within myself because I know that I cannot control the narrative of what people say about me or around me and that actually other people's thoughts about me have more to do with them than they have to do with me. But since my deep desire to talk about things and discuss things is part of the reason that I even have a booktube channel, I still did want to discuss it. That's also why I wanted to do a video about it instead of continuing to talk about it on Twitter because Twitter has limited space, a lot can get lost in translation, and people bring their own experiences into Twitter. I mean this as well, but a little bit more into Twitter when there's such a condensed version of what you're actually talking about and there's not a ton of room for nuance, then things get misconstrued, people bring their own experiences and read into what you're saying even if that's not what you're saying, and people read into tone and how they think you're talking to them instead of how you're actually talking to them. So at least here, you can see how I'm talking to you. But I will talk about more of the Twitter phenomenon around discussion later, because I can't resist. So for the entirety of this video, I want to put a disclaimer on here so I'm not going to have to keep repeating myself. For the entirety of this video, when I'm talking about topics of discussion, about bringing up critical reviewing, positively reviewing whatever, I am not talking about racism, sexism, calling out abuse and abusers, anything like that that are very serious topics. I am talking about very much opinion, true opinion based things, not what people say like, that's just my opinion, you can't get offended. No, like the actual things that have gray area and nuance. Wants. So for the entirety of this video, I am not talking about any of the isms and people trying to defend that with their shitty behavior. So the first thing about this discussion that we've talked about before on my channel and we talk about whenever this comes up is that there is actually a false dichotomy between critically reading and reading for fun. It implies that you can only do one or the other, when actually there is a plethora of space in between to do both, and doing it one way doesn't mean you're not doing it the other way. I think the language of critical review has also meant for so long to people negative review when that has never been the case. So from here on out in this video, I'm actually going to talk about reviews that include analysis. That is, by its nature, a critical review when you're analyzing a text, both the positive and the negative, but I think the word critical trips some people up, making it seem like you are only pointing out the negative things when really an analysis is pointing out both things about a text, a piece of media, anything like that. Madi from My Name is Madi Inez recently did a video about this false dichotomy and I urge you to go watch her video because if this was still like classic what, like 2014 booktube where I could do a video response and YouTube still let me do that, this would be the video response to her video. So her video really eloquently dives into this dichotomy of you it's not one or the other, some of the key points in her video are that, one, it's not about just critically reviewing or just reading for fun and there being nothing in between. That critical does not mean you aren't enjoying what you're doing. That you can analyze something and you can still enjoy that analysis. Or that you can still really be enjoying what you're reading and still analyze it. That there is not a one or the other phenomenon. She also made some really good points that not everything on booktube is a review, but a review by its nature is an analysis of a work. But that there are other ways that you can talk about books that aren't necessarily a review. 
I really recommend her video. She brings up a lot of great points and she is eloquent as always, so I will link that for you to check out. So when I've talked about reviews in the past, I've said that I don't necessarily trust or find helpful reviews that don't include analysis of some kind. This is especially true in the case of reviewers who tend to give a lot of ratings on either one or the other side of the spectrum, either a lot of five stars or a lot of one stars. And when I discuss that, I'm talking about what I find helpful as a reader, number one, and also that I'm talking about the review itself and not the reviewer. So I will discuss this more in depth because this comes back around later on in the conversation we're going to have today. But if I or a lot of other people say they don't trust a certain review if it just includes a star rating and doesn't really include analysis, it's not saying that we think that a reviewer is being dishonest or that that isn't their feeling about the book. It's just that we as readers have no way of determining if we're going to enjoy that book if there's not some kind of analysis. And if somebody only gives reviews on like one or the other side of the spectrum, typically speaking, then we as readers also have no way to determine what they really like in value, comparing it to what we really like in value, if there's no differentiation among the reviews. And with all of this, I'm talking about people that have a platform, people that have a platform that influences other people reading books, picking things up, things like that. If you're just reading on Goodreads for yourself, that is a different thing. Maybe you're just logging things for yourself. But if you're reading at all for any kind of audience, then I do believe that it's important to, even if you're just reading for fun and you're not doing any kind of deep analysis, again, you don't have to, but just being aware of the things that might come up in fiction and giving people warning so they're not further harmed. Now myself or anybody else as a reader saying what they find helpful in a review for them is not telling anyone what they should do in their review, what they should enjoy in their review, or what to do with their content. Someone generally talking about reviews, not targeting a specific person and just saying what they find helpful in a very general respectful way is not at all targeting of other people bashing another kind of review or saying that those other kinds of reviews are invalid because they both serve a kind of purpose. Like Mari mentioned in her video, not all the content on booktube is reviews. So there's plenty of valid content that doesn't have to do with analysis of a book. And there's a lot of enjoyment that can be found both from the viewer and the producer of that content in that. Myself or anybody else saying that they enjoy a certain type of review, whether that's a more analytical review or a more just gushy type of review, both are valid and it's not invalidating the other. But I'm going to talk about that more when we talk about Twitter more towards the end. Now I want to talk about a couple other topics around this discussion. Since we have this discussion more often, I do see certain things coming up a lot around it that I do want to address. One of the frequent arguments I see if myself or anyone else brings up that they enjoy more analysis in their reviews and that's what they find helpful as a reader is that, well, I or whoever rate highly because I know how to pick out books that I'll enjoy, so I end up rating everything really high because I know how to pick out things that I'm going to enjoy all the time. And this is always an interesting response to me because it implies that a person who is reviewing a little more broadly that they don't pick out books that they're hoping to enjoy. <laughs> because I'm somebody that picks out books that I hope to enjoy. I'm not a hate reader unless I'm reading something for a project that I have to read, but I know I'm not going to like, but I have to read it for something, then I might go into a book knowing I'm not going to like it. But that happens maybe once a year, honestly. I go into every book hoping to enjoy it, hoping it's a new favorite. And as you guys know, I pick out books like based on the tropes that I read about, based on what other people say about them, etc. So for me as a reader and a viewer of other people's content, that's why I personally enjoy and find helpful reviews that include that analysis, because it helps me pick out books that I'll enjoy. And analysis doesn't have to include deep analysis. I think also when people hear critical reviews or analysis, they're thinking like that it's a project at school, that it's very academic, high academic, when really analysis can be fairly simple. Analysis can even be those videos that are like, if you like this, try that for books so that someone can compare, oh, I really liked the tropes and themes in this book. This book also includes that. That is a form of analysis. Also trope recommendations videos where people talk about a lot of books that feature the same tropes. That's also a level of analysis and comparison that people can make. The second part of this response also ties into what I was saying earlier and that it creates this false dichotomy of people who are analyzing what they're reading aren't enjoying what they're reading. It implies that they're not having fun, that they're going into books hoping to find things to pick apart when that's not how I operate and how I think a lot of people operate. Sure, there are entire channels and personalities devoted to ripping apart books, but I would say that that's more of a minority than a majority when it comes to reviewers in general. I think this response also comes off weirdly elitist and defensive 
because we pick books similarly, actually. Again, I think most people pick books hoping to enjoy them or get something out of them. This response just simply points out that we have different standards for our reading and for what we're going to enjoy, and that's totally fine. Someone saying that they enjoy more analysis and that they're slightly pickier is not saying that pickier equals better. Most books have a combination of things that I really enjoy and then things that maybe I'm a little more meh about. I enjoy most books that I read, the grand majority of books that I read, but most of my books fall in the three to four star range because even if there's tropes and writing styles and themes that I really enjoy there might be a few other elements that I also look at when I read that I just don't enjoy as much. And that's not even me pouring a lot of energy into the analysis. That's just how I read naturally. So again, it's again, that's not good or bad. That's just how I read. The third topic that comes up and that I was bringing up on Twitter as well is to be mindful of the co-opting of just let people enjoy things, just let people have fun, is a way for mostly white people and people of privilege to ignore harmful content to marginalize groups in fiction. An example that's really easy to bring up, even though I hate bringing it up all the time, actually, is Twilight. Anytime Twilight comes up, there's a ton of people that say, let me have this, this is part of nostalgia for me, I really enjoy this, and actively ignore the harm that it does to native populations. And people can enjoy something while also pointing out its harm, and for some reason this is another false dichotomy that we create in the book world of it has to be one or the other, and that's just not the case. Brody recently did a video on native voices in this community and how people do have a tendency to push aside native voices in regards to Twilight as well as other kinds of fiction, so I recommend watching their video as well to get some insight into this because as a community we're still not great about that. There are some groups that we are very good and have gotten better about pointing out harm, but there's still so many that we ignore, and that's why I did bring up that whole concept of let people enjoy things when it comes to analysis, because I think it is a major part of there's a lot of things that we can't ignore in fiction. That's another interesting thing about this conversation is that on both sides of the conversation, there can be this element of the other side feeling they're superior, or that there's a certain amount of privilege having to do with being able to do one or the other. In the Twitter discussion, I got some comments about how it's a privilege for me to be able to read books that that I can analyze and maybe take a chance on because some people don't have like the money or the funds necessarily to read whatever, don't have the time even to read whatever. Which again implies that I do have those privileges necessarily. I've talked about how like especially when I'm working full time I don't have the time to read things that I might not enjoy and yet I still have had plenty of things that I read during times when I'm really busy that I hope to love and don't enjoy. So we have that element but then on the other side we have the element of it's a privilege to be able to just read things for fun without looking at the potentially problematic content in certain works as well. So when things like that come up where both sides are pointing to the other as having some kind of privilege, I think that's when we get into an area of these are not black and white conversations. There is gray area and a spectrum for this. And then the way we talk about this sort of needs to change, not just about critical reviewing necessarily, but about topics like I mentioned, that aren't malicious and that are truly opinion-based and aren't the things like I mentioned at the beginning of the video of racism, sexism, abuse, misogyny, all of the bad things that we hear about in politics all the time these days. So with that being said, I want to touch on a little bit of how we do discuss these kinds of non-malicious topics, especially on a platform like Twitter. Like I've mentioned, I have done videos on Twitter discourse before and my opinions on it and how I think these kinds of things happen, so I will link that in this video as well. But I think there's a lot of things that are in play here when it comes to discussions about non-malicious topics, actual opinion-based topics on Twitter. So first off, for me, when I create my content, I choose to not ever talk about specific issues as far as discussions. So I am never somebody that's going to point out a specific person, necessarily quote tweet them and rip apart their argument or make a video about a specific person or anything like that because I just don't find that to be super helpful. I only really dive into discussions when it becomes a theme or a trend that I'm seeing a lot of and a lot of there, it becomes a whole discussion across the community instead of it being about one person because I find discussions about themes because of reading, to be much more helpful, to be much more constructive, to be much more complex and interesting and something we can all learn and grow from instead of two people kind of going at each other in a disagreement. 
So with that being said, there is this assumption that I've seen on Twitter, especially, that if somebody has an opinion, a creator has an opinion about a book, about just content, what they like as a person, that somehow expressing that opinion is telling other people how to act, how to do their content, how to feel about a book, and that anyone that disagrees with them is somehow wrong. And I don't know how we necessarily get to that line of thinking, but I have some theories. A lot of people over-identify with works of fiction or with even work that maybe they would put out there, although that's a little bit more tightly aligned, but especially with works of fiction or even the work that their favorite creator does or something like that, and they consider any critique or analysis of that to be a personal attack on them. We talk about this a lot as creators when somebody gets really mad at us for not liking a book that they loved. It becomes then this personal thing and people get really offended even though someone's not talking about them, not criticizing them as a creator, as somebody that enjoys books, whatever. They're just saying their opinion about that work, about that maybe style of video, whatever, without it being about a particular person. I also think that that honestly gives creators on these platforms, especially book platforms where we're not like, we're not famous. <laughs> I think it gives people way too much power. If you really think that we as creators have some kind of sway over telling you what the rules are, what you should do with your content, what you should do with your reading or your feelings. I do not feel that way about myself or about any other creator on this platform, as if there's any kind of rules for how to do booktube, how to do reviews, how to read. Nah. My influence and other booktubers' influence never has to do with how other people create their content. I'm somebody that talks about books and my opinions about books and lets you know where I sit with the analysis that I do with books so that you can decide what you want to read, but I'm never telling someone what to do with their reading or their content, and no booktuber is. If they are, then they're kind of a shitty person. The other thing about Twitter just generally as a platform, and our Western society especially, the United States but other parts of the world as well, the way that we have political conversations and fandom conversations on that platform especially has created this false dichotomy and polarization in nearly all conversations that we have, even when it doesn't have to do with that malicious, harmful, maybe more political type content. It gives a lot of people this idea because of how we argue politically these days, that if you don't agree with me, then you're against me, you're my polar opposite, you are my enemy, you think down on me, then I think down on you, and you're a shit person, and it becomes this like really deep personal thing because that is the case with some of these things where people are actively harming other people with their like political opinions or policies they put in place and things like that. But that's not the case in these, again, non-malicious, respectful, general conversations about opinions about interpreting works of fiction. Because of us constantly being steeped in that kind of environment, especially on a place like Twitter, it means that a lot of us bring the same intensity to these conversations about not harmful things as we would bring to a conversation about those harmful topics. Not all conversations warrant the same level of intensity as those topics. And that's not tone policing or telling anybody how to react because tone policing applies to those kinds of topics in which people are actively harmed. Like I mentioned earlier, with this conversation and with a lot of conversations, so I'm saying this again more generally than just the book analysis conversation, there are people on both sides saying it's a privilege to do it this way, it's a privilege to do it that way. So in that case, it largely evens itself out and doesn't need to become this pick a side, we're against each other type of conversation. I think also with this true opportunity for discussion, learning, and growth in these kinds of non-malicious, respectful topics gets squashed because of our desire and sort of programming at this point to pick a side. When most things in life, as I mentioned earlier, have a gray area and exist on a spectrum. This especially targets people of color on any platform. I've seen this time and time again where creators of color will say something and people will pounce on them in the same way that you would someone who, again, is an abuser or racist or whatever, instead of asking for clarification. I think in so many instances, especially in our community that is fairly small, obviously it's growing and I don't know everyone in the community and I don't expect you to know everyone in the community, but I think in situations where we generally kind of all know of each other, it would make sense in, again, these non-malicious situations to give people the benefit of the doubt and ask for some clarification before necessarily being so against them and angry. And that could lead to, again, more discussions of these topics instead of just picking a side. Because I do believe that most people with these kinds of opinion-based things fall somewhere in the middle and not on one side. 
which is true of me even, with this actual conversation. I think the way we engage politically with Twitter a lot these days also encourages people to not read full threads necessarily or full discussions. It encourages people to not find the source of topics and just discuss what they're seeing on their own feed, which is interesting because a lot of times in threads or original posts, things are addressed that other people are commenting on and the original poster probably agrees with what people are already saying, but now it's misconstrued as if they're all on opposing sides, when generally speaking in these conversations, everyone is falling mostly in the middle anyway. I believe this further encourages that kind of polarization that we have, because it encourages people to take things out of context. It becomes this giant game of telephone where people don't really know the source of what happened, and this is just the nature of Twitter, obviously. Not everyone follows everyone else, but they see someone talking about it and they don't know what the source of it was, so then they start sharing their opinion, and it becomes just a lot of noise. And many people don't even know what they are responding to when it was originally said, so again, they could agree with what the original poster was saying and not even realize it. So then we have this really chaotic energy going on on like book Twitter, and no one really knows why, and it's frequently not even necessary. Barring the issues I talked about with the disclaimer at the beginning of the video. I'm actually really guilty of this as well, and it's something that I'm evaluating with my Twitter use as well, because I will frequently not see the source of Twitter discussions and just see people talk about them and then I'll put out my opinion and I've realized if I can't find the source of the discourse, do I need to add to this if I don't actually know what the two opposing sides are, which like I said before, there's never really true opposing sides in most of these conversations. And I'm going to be actively making sure I take a step back from that and looking a little further instead of necessarily feeling like I need to comment on something not knowing what the source of it was. Because as I said, I think most conversations that we have in our community warrant the benefit of the doubt. And if people didn't respond with the same intensity as they do to those more harmful discussions, we could actually have a plethora of different discussions and I think learn and grow as a community so much more than we have because we keep getting bogged down in the surface level discussions. For example, with this conversation, if we didn't jump to this false dichotomy polarization, we could have had conversations about how people choose the books they read and how they choose what to analyze in the books they read. What some alternative content is for people who don't really like reviewing, because again in a lot of these conversations we have people saying, I don't even like reviewing. So then let's discuss what we all can like brainstorm different ways to talk about books that don't really have to do with this like deep reviewing analysis if you don't want to do that, or even just surface level analysis. Or even discuss how how you pick out books if reading reviews and looking at reviews isn't important to you and that kind of analysis isn't how you pick out books, well then how do you? So those are just three topics, well four or five because I combined some of them, that I thought up of off the top of my head when thinking about this that we could have all dived into when talking about this like difference in analysis and things like that instead of this kind of false idea that we have because like I said kind of the whole point of this video is that it's not one or the other, that we all exist on a spectrum of what we find find fun with our reading, what we find fun with our reviewing, what we find helpful when we look at other people's content, and that us finding things helpful about other people's content doesn't invalidate or say that we don't care about people's content that isn't helpful necessarily to us. Also that creators are not rule makers and that sharing our opinions is not invalidating the opinions of others. That by sharing our opinions of a book or how we choose to create content or the kinds of content we find helpful, that is not saying that that's the way that all the content should be done, because that would be incredibly boring. That we can save a lot of our energy for those big topics, for those more harmful topics on Twitter, instead of using it for every single topic and responding to every single topic with the same level of intensity, when we can really be using these non-malicious, respectful conversations to be talking about things deeper in the community when it comes to books and bookish topics, instead of repeating the same things over and over. Which we probably will do because that's just the nature of humans and history and society and stuff. But those are my main takeaways, so I hope this was helpful. I tried to combine a lot of topics into one video, but it was hard to try to parse this out because a lot of these influence each other and I didn't want to not bring one part of the conversation up and then have to have a whole discussion in the comments when I could just kind of touch on everything here as chaotic as it was. So comment down below and let me know your thoughts. Let me know some topics that you wish we discussed more in the community instead of feeling like we're all on opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to reading because generally speaking if we're all on booktube I think we all enjoy talking about books and we're all more similar than different when it comes to our love of fiction. So thank you all for watching and I'll see all of you guys soon. Bye!